Hi, this is Scott Dunn with Rocket Line Solutions, one of the Agile coaches and trainers. And we just finished up the Certified Agile Leadership class, and I thought it was interesting uh, to share some of the feedback from the class that uh, was insightful. So we asked what were some of the takeaways uh, from the class, and one of the takeaways was the idea of the uh, leadership agility, that as a manager or a leader, there's a kind of a growth process we would go through moving from expert to achiever to catalyst, and as a takeaway, that was significant. Now the reason I think it's important and applicable for many people is that this idea of expert or achiever, the expert leader who is the one who's quick to solve problems, or hey, I need to talk to you and it's one-on-one -on -one communication, or I, hey, we need to have a closed door meeting and I'm making sure people are doing what I asked them to do, and, and I've been there as an expert leader, um, gets things done but is dependent on them. Therefore, I can't take a vacation, I can't take a break because if I'm not around to solve problems, they don't get solved. And I would add, that doesn't scale very well. This is the classic case of if only we could uh, copy so-and-so, if only we could duplicate so-and-so, uh, that might be what your expert leader might look like. The next stage, if we can move past that, is the achiever, the one who does get results and has an idea, it's not just I telling you, but it's my way, but unfortunately what that means is I gotta co-opt you into my way. Uh, at times I might feel manipulative, I'm just trying to get you on board. You're either on the bus or off the bus, and hey, I know who you need to talk to, let me patch you through to these people. So I'm still kinda like the orchestrator making those things happen, so that is more effective perhaps, but still has its limits, and we're still not necessarily getting people's buy-in or feedback organically, we're kind of selling them on our ideas of what that could be. Not necessarily a bad thing, but it does have its limits. You look at those two segments of achiever and uh, uh, expert leadership, that's really about 80% of the people out there as managers and leaders. So it's a significant portion. The reason it's in, in particularly important for us in this agile space is we're in a complex area of thought work where the right way isn't necessarily known. It's the team that will come up with it, or it depends on what the customer says. How do we fold that in, co-opt that? I can't just make a plan to execute against that plan, um, like I could in other more traditional type projects, but not in this space. So the takeaway for us is what does that look like to move ahead to the uh, catalytic leader? the one who knows that they need to have many to many conversations and they want to get people's ideas and it's a lot more about we doing this kind of work. So some people kind of categorize it as there's a doer of the achiever, um, the leader as the, uh, sorry, doer as an expert, leader as an achiever, and the coach as this catalytic leader. And we certainly see that idea of coaching coming more and more about within the space of Agile and Scrum and the role of the Scrum Master and Agile Coach. But even your managers and leaders can significantly help the system of change by flipping this role into, instead of being the expert who just answers everyone's questions, flip that back and say, well, what do you think we could do? What are those options? So they're teaching people to think through problems and make them more like clock builders instead of time tellers uh, in that system as a coach. So I thought that was really significant that people kind of had that as a takeaway and that idea of coach, do, and lead. Last as a takeaway, someone found it interesting that there's this idea of what we call emotional bandwidth. How much space do you have to try to do? If you're gonna flip and co-op people's opinions, we all have difficult, challenging, interesting people in the workplace. How do we do in terms of getting that input and handling that well? How do we do in terms of getting feedback from people? And sometimes, if I'm used to kind of saying, just, just go forth and do, hey, I don't pay you to think, I just need to get this job done, we're not used to receiving feedback, and we may not be a space to kind of receive that well. And un unintentionally, when we say, hey, we're gonna go agile, we have retrospectives, we have these meetings where we co-opt and get people's input, but if we don't receive it well, if we shut the door on that, if we inadvertently kind of say, that's not a, that's not a block, that's not an issue, you shut down the very source of the people who are the ones who organically could get the best solutions for those problems because they're closest to the work. So part of that emotional bandwidth is as a leader, do you carve out space to say, I know how to practice and receive feedback. I have space in, in how I take care of myself and lead and, and, um, and practice this. Did I also have space to receive that as well? So those were takeaways just from the class I thought was interesting. I uh, really wanted to share those. If you want to find out more about the Certified Agile Leadership class, what does that look like for the role of manager or leader in this agile transformation and change, feel free to check out the information on our website, rocketlandsolutions.com, and hope to see you in the class.